Last week was a meat night, not a milk night. It was college-level stuff. Maybe three-fourths of you were here last week. Have tend to have different crowds. I encourage you to go back and listen to it. I don't. I know it's sort of laborious, but it's a college-level class that will help you understand your times. First uh, Chronicles twelve thirty-two says this. So this was in the Old Testament back when they were in the war. From Issachar's descendants, Issachar is one of the twelve tribes of Israel. They were divided up into twelve sort of subgroups. Tribes, and Issachar is one of them. In that subgroup of Issachar, from Issachar's descendants, there were 200 leaders who understood the times and knew what Israel should do. Now, ever since October the 26th, when I was in Washington, D.C., that's a little white word that's underneath the table on a white piece of paper. And... um, The Lord said, I want you to do two things in this new era, which is going to be like a long period of time, not like a season, which is we have four physical seasons. Spiritual seasons can last longer or shorter. He said, walk in my presence, teach people how to be in my presence. We talked a little bit about that in January, about the Father. We'll come back around. This is probably the rest of the decade type theme. And he said, prepare my people to be my bride. Now, that's a huge subject. Basically, it sort of boils down to preparing his people to, to walk like him and be like him. But how do you do this on a practical basis? And so one of the things I feel led, and we've been talking about it, we talked about last week, tonight's going to be another college-level type class. You know, sometimes they're a real encouragement, charge, send you out, but these are meat that are deep. And what I'm trying to do is help us to understand our times in the Western culture in America. Because if we do not know who our enemy is, you cannot defeat your enemy. Now, we are not preoccupied with our enemy But if you don't understand spiritual warfare, that's what we were talking about at 5.30 at the prophetic gathering. Um, I encourage you. We say we start at 6, but we really sort of start at 5.30. But um, uh, if you don't even understand the concept of spiritual warfare, when you're in it, you won't know what's going on. You won't know your rights. Now, there's a fine thread that's going on here. And I'm trying to thread this needle here. One, with with most churches of our genre, it's all up, it's all positive, it's all faith. And we are to be all up, positive faith, and we need messages on being up, positive faith. I'm not not, um, downplaying that, and I'll do that. But there is also a thread. We need to know what the enemy is up and know what we're up against so that we know how to be positive, and how to apply our faith. Most faith teachings is about what to do to get stuff in our life or to, or to flow in. And that's valid. But I'm telling you here in the last days, one of the biggest things he's wanting us to use faith for is to destroy the works of the devil, which is not just physical things, which is a part of it, like healing, depression, and discouragement, but it is institutional strongholds that is stealing freedom in our governments, institutional strongholds in our schools that's planting demonic ideas. He's wanting those things destroyed. Remember it said, Jesus said, if you speak to this mountain you and, and rebuke it, you can cast it into the sea. Mountains almost always in the New Testament means government, means authority figures. He is not just wanting to change you. He is wanting to change our society to not be a theocracy, but to walk in the principles of the kingdom of God. And it, 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 it takes, it is going to take some serious faith to do it. And some of you, that's some of your main assignments. Uh, I've never talked to Daly about this, but I've been to Africa several times. She was over there for a long time. How many years were you over there? Three years. 
So let me tell you what the, the balance is. So, so, so let me come back to the Africa story. So one balance is it's all positive and never mentioning what's going on in the culture. Another balance is telling how bad the culture, and, and if we're not careful, it's going to overwhelm us. In the end, his kingdom wins. And he's going to win through us. So we have to know what victory is. And he wants it to move from us being victorious. And it's in some ways it's sort of sad about the Christian life. All the talk is about us how to be victorious. And we need that. But I'm looking for a people, and we're here. We want to be victorious, but I want you to not just be victorious over you. I want you to change things around you with the power of God. I want strategies not just for us, but strategies how to change the school systems, how to change your employ, employment and place, how to change the state, federal, county, whatever institution, because when we break those mountains that are demonic, it produces a more freedom, it produces a, a flow that is almost hard to, to um, underestimate. And so back to the Africa story. I won't mention the country. I've been over there several times. Those people, and Nigeria was this way, those people on a one-on-one level like this talk about God all the time. This shopping center would have three churches in it. They were everywhere. On a one-on-one level, I mean, there's just Christianity everywhere. But their country is corrupt Their country is abusive. Their country is just a disaster. I'm not mentioning which one. I've been in several. But there's some similar patterns. Why? Because they stopped at the individual level. Yeah, that dog, man. He's supposed to move him at 6 p.m., but he didn't. I'll talk to him this week. It's the cabinet shop over here. And so um, it has to move beyond us because, I mean, Nigeria is a mess right now. I mean, it was like 225 people kidnapped by, by Islam again this week. Why? Because they, their individual faith was just for them and not for their whole garden around us. And so what I've been talking about is to try to give a holistic view. And last week, you can go to relationshipchurch.com, you can go to resources, you can find the YouTube channel, you can click on it. I'm, I'm just going to say what we talked about, but I'm not, I don't, it's spent the whole time, I'm not going to talk about it. But there's a three-stranded demonic stronghold of ideas and philosophies that is America and it's not God. And we need to understand it, and I gave the biblical antidote to it. And just like in two minutes, we talked about Sigmund The three thoughts starts with Freudism, Sigmund Freud. We learned that he is the one that, and and psychologists picked it up, counselors picked it up, people picked it up, and said, you are a victim and you're a product of your circumstances, and we may be a product of our circumstances, of our family. I know we go through abusive stuff. I'm not downplaying that. But he basically said you could never get out of it. We are victims, but Jesus, but when you meet a victim that's feeling sorry for themselves and stuck, have compassion, have mercy, but say, you know, I know a victor whose name is Jesus Christ. And if you're willing to break this pattern, and it is hard, it is ingrained in everything. It is ingrained from the federal government all the way through the school systems, and most Christians think it's normal. No, John 10.10, 10, Jesus said, I have come to give you life and life more abundantly. And it doesn't matter your background, he can pull you out. The second thread, and so we talked about this, is Marxism by Karl Marx. Out of that, communism came. He actually didn't advocate communism, but communism uses stuff. And this was the point, and tell me if this is not America. His thing was, we're all to be equal in outcome, not opportunity. We all want equal opportunities. And America is actually pretty good compared to most countries around the world. It's not perfect. But it is unbiblical for equal outcome. It is not God's kingdom. As I said last week, Reinhard Bonnke, one of the greatest evangelists the world has ever known, needed millions of dollars a year to do his job. God is not an equal outcome What God is in, He will give you what you need for the calling He has on your life. And then we can't walk in envy and comparison and and covetousness. 
I do not need millions of dollars to do what I do here in northwest Georgia. I don't. I need about 150000 a year. And that's what we run, pretty much, give or take. 125, whatever. Is Reinhard Bonnke different than me? No. Is Reinhard Bonnke more favored of God than me? No. Is Reinhard Bonnke more righteous than me? Probably, but hopefully not. I'm not, I'm not judging Reinhard Bonnke. What's the difference? If I'm jealous over what he has, it says to him who has been given much, much is required. I'm required to account for 150,000. He's required to account for millions. It has nothing to do with him or his righteousness or his walk. I mean, those affect him. Don't get me wrong. It's his calling. And if I say God loves him 20 times more than me, or I don't know how many millions he took in, that is Marxism. And it's affected our country. So you can go on. I talked a lot. The last one was uh, Charles Darwin. So you got Freudism, Marxism, and Darwinism. Is, is. Don't listen to me. It's not coming. It's here. What I am teaching is the minority of the minority. That's all right. All it takes is a seed, and there's a bigger seed in here than a mustard seed. And it eventually will, will reverse and come back. But Marxism is this. It steals. Most Christians believe in evolution. Why? Because they don't want to look like a, uh, a Luddite. They don't want to look stupid. But you realize there's no more scientific proof for evolution than there is for creation, and there's less circumstantial evidence. But this is what happens. All these are demonic strategies to steal a relationship and a purpose with God. You're a victim, not a victor. You're not unique. Everybody's going to be the same and get the same. And this is the, the amazing thing about so many Christians. I don't. They're scared of science. There's no reason to. Most scientists, or at least a huge portion, maybe even 50% or more, believe in at least intelligent design because they realize it's unworkable. How does love evolve in the survival of the fittest? This is the thing. If you're an evolutionist Christian... You can learn the science and you can be very good at it and get confidence. But if you're evolutionary Christian, you are not special. You are not created in God's image. You have no spiritual DNA. What do you think happened when you evolved from a chimp to you? All of a sudden you got a spirit? Does a chimp have a spirit? Does a chip, chimp have a, a calling? This is the chimp created in the image of God. What mutation happened that all of a sudden you're created in the image of God? But it's everywhere, isn't it? It's even in the church, the victim, the sameness. So, it was good. We talked about that. That's the meat. We're going to move on today. And uh, I needed to review. But see, if we understand that, we can give hope to people. You're not a one-cell protozoa that evolved millions of years ago. You are a one person created with spirit, soul, and body, and you look like your creator. And I tell you what, they may have a trouble with the science, but there's going to be a spark that comes alive in them. Maybe there's a reason I'm alive. If you believe in evolution, as most Christians do, you might as well just eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow you go back to dust. I know that's harsh, but I'm willing. If you want to talk afterwards, we can... Talk it, talk it more. I'm supposed to be at y'all's place Thursday night. Do you want to talk about evolution and creation? We'll talk about that. We'll get a deeper dive on it. So, but I'm excited about this next little part. I'm going to tell you the two major temptations that the devil is using and it's working in America. Really the West, really the whole world, but it's really working in America. And so the two major temptations... Not to tempt you. I don't want you to go this way. But if you realize the temptations, when you see them coming, you're going, no, 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 no. I am not going to be the created in that image. I'm going to be created in something else. 
And so this, these two temptations are sex and riches. And we're going to delve then into it because the Bible has warned us all about it. Revelation especially has warned us this is going to happen in the last days. And it's played out in two cities. Now, we don't normally teach on Revelation here because most of it I don't understand. But slowly, as time goes along, he's starting to give me little pieces here and there of, of what's going on. And so you're going to see two cities. The city of the New Jerusalem, which is us, we hope, and the city of Babylon. And we're going to see the characteristics of the city of New Jerusalem and the city of Babylon. And when you see it, you're going to go, at least I did, maybe we can talk about it. Babylon is here. It's in the West. It's in America. Now let me talk a little bit about Revelation. And I probably may be getting in trouble here, but we'll, we'll, I think it's important to know. Most Christians in America, not in the world think that America is all in the future. The facts is, you'll see, and I'm just going to have to hit the highlights. I can't, I'm not going to do a detailed study on this. You'll see all through the New Testament, it talks about the last days and the last day, capital D. There is a distinction. Jesus was real clear. He said, okay, let me give you an example. Acts 2.14. Turn over there in your Bibles on your phone, or whatever. I'm going to take a little bit longer for you to catch up. Usually I just read it so that you can see this, and Craig's not just making this stuff up. This is what I'm going to tell you. The last days, say last days to the people around you, started with Jesus. We've been living in the last days. Now this goes against most Western end times teaching. We've been living in the last days for 2,000 years. Are we in the last day? No. Acts 2.14, this is out of the NIV. And this is after the upper room, the 110 people up there, they're praying, the fire came down, speaking in tongues, all this cool stuff. You know, I speak in tongues a lot. I've heard other people speak in tongues. I've not had tongues of fire on my head. Has anybody ever seen tongues of fire on somebody's head? I, they did it 2,000 years ago. I want to see it sometime. Side point. You can shoot that rabbit. Then Peter stood up with the 11. And so there's a big crowd outside. What's going on? Because remember it said there's a big rushing wind that came through the city and addressed the crowd. Fellow Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. These people are not drunk as you suppose. It's only 9 in the morning. No, verse 16. No, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel 17. This is what was spoken by the prophet Joel 17. In the last days, God said, I will pour out my spirit on all your people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your own men will see visions. Your own men will dream dreams, etc., etc., etc. The last days have been going on since Pentecost. That'll mess your theology up on the eschatology, but it'll help us as we get going forward. Turn over to 1 John 2.18. Now, I'll tell you what, there's too many verses here. I'm going to speed up. Go to Hebrews 1.1. 1, 1. You can go and read that on your own. If I be here, will you all be here for two hours in this college class today? Are you all right? You all hanging with me? If you need to phase out for 30 seconds, it's all right. Hebrews 1.1. 1, 1. This is out of the NIV. In the past, okay, this is in Hebrews, okay? This is the first century. God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets and many times and in various ways, but in these last days, He has spoken to us by His Son. Whom appointed heir, who he appointed heir of all things and through whom all he made the universe. Okay, so I'm, you get the point. You, you look this up, you're going to see last days. Because a lot of people, when you see last days in Revelation, which we're going to get to in a minute, they'll go, well, this is in the future. Maybe, maybe not. This is what I'm starting to realize. Revelation is a record of what's going to happen in the last days. Some of it has happened. Some of it has not happened. 
Some of it will happen on the last day, and some of it repeats over and over and over and over again through 2,000 years. Well, how do you know what's what? I have no idea. (laughs) Sometimes God will show you, and sometimes He won't. Last days is one big trance slash dream. Most dreams are metaphors. They're symbols that have to be interpreted. If you hear God speak to you in your still small voice, it's almost always clear and to the point like a conversation. Dreams are not that way. Dreams are legit. Visions are legit. Revelation is legit. But most of it is not to be taken literally. It's, okay, what is the Lord saying metaphorically through this? All right, Lord, Craig, speed up. Turn over to, let's look at the first city. Turn over to Revelation 18.3. And I'm just going to jump into this. He is describing Revelation 18.3 towards the end. He is describing the city of Babylon. In a minute we're going to see the city of the New Jerusalem. And I'm not going to read all the verses around it, but here it says in verse 3, describing the city of Babylon. Revelation 18, 3. For all the nations have drunk of the wine of the passion of her immorality. And the kings of the earth have committed acts of immorality with her. And the merchants of the earth have become rich by the wealth of her sensuality. We're going to get some more verses, but as you go through here, you're going to see Babylon is characterized by sex and riches. And that's how she held the kings of the earth in her sway. If you had to describe the two strongest, this is Craig's opinion, territorial strongholds over the West, especially America, especially the West and Northeast, it is sex in the pursuit of riches. So are you saying the city of Babylon is here in America? I'm saying this. Maybe, I don't tend to think so, but maybe in the future there's a legitimate geographical on a Google Earth map city of Babylon. Do you realize there's not one now? There is a, new, there is a Jerusalem, but not a new Jerusalem. There there is no Babylon on earth. There used to be, but God destroyed it. What I'm saying is these two cities represent two fault patterns, two ways of living, two territorial clash of kingdoms of who's going to win. The flesh being led by your flesh of sex and riches. I mean, how else? Those are the two strongest over America. This is the most sex-obsessed place I have ever been in my life. It was not this way even 30 years ago. I'm 63, so I can say that. I go to other countries. Yes, there's always challenges, but not like this place. It is sex-obsessed. It's not even sex anymore. It has moved into perversion of sex because normal adultery, fornication, is, and I know I'm being blunt, but we're understanding our times, is not enough anymore. It's not fulfilling anymore. It's like if you take drugs for a long time, you don't get the same high, so you have to go to harder drugs. If you, don't, if you do adultery and fornication long enough, it doesn't satisfy anymore. You have to go to more perverted stuff. This place is daggum perverted. But we're going to see what the new Jerusalem looks like. And the pursuit of riches. It's not riches for the sake of riches. Go down to verse 7 of Revelation 18. It's what riches can buy. And it gets, it gets more positive here. Revelation 18, 7. But we have to understand, this is not just behavior on an individual level. This is territorial strategies by the enemy to enslave you. Like to enslave you as a victim, to enslave you as an animal, like for Darwinism, or just an evolved animal, to enslave you to sameness. He is trying to enslave you to living by your body and its desires and not the spirit in its leading. Revelation 18, 7. She gave herself, talking about Babylon again. You can go back through and read all this. You start reading this, it's, it looks like it's reading like the front paper. 
She gave herself, she gave herself, she gave herself glory. Do we not do that all day long in America, trying to get attention, trying to get fame, trying to get fortune? That's all glory. And we do it in the church. That's one of the biggest things we've had to battle here. And I battle in other churches where I'm consulting is, why is your worship team doing what it's doing? It looks like to me it's bringing attention to yourself. Don't ever go down that line. The Lord told me clearly several years ago, He says, whatever glory you steal consciously or unconsciously from me, I don't get. Well, that's intense. Gave herself glory and luxury. That's what riches buy, is luxury to make us feel, get all the good stuff. Now give her, this is, this is the spirit of Jesus talking to the angel. Now give her, towards the end, it hasn't happened yet. Now give her just as much torture and misery, she says to herself. And then she says to herself, now I'm going to get a little deep here, and if it doesn't, if you don't click with this, fine. She says to herself, I'm a queen. She's promoting herself. On a throne. There's this concept, let me just read it. Not a widow. That's, I'm going to develop that. There's this concept in psychology called projection. You tell other people what they are, but you're really that. And she's saying, I'm not a widow. Because we're going to see as we look at the city of New Jerusalem, the city of New Jerusalem may be a physical city. He's going to have, there is a physical city, Jerusalem. And he's going to, he's a, he's going to come back as a king and his headquarters is going to be in Jerusalem. But the meaning is not limited to a physical be, building. It is a thought pattern. It's an idol, it's a ideology. It is so much bigger. Because if we're just have to be in that physical building, New Jerusalem, even though it's huge, what about the rest of the people on the earth? Are they out of it? No. He has to have a headquarters to reign from, and he's going to. There's lots of verses on that. But it is that's the least about it. He said the New Jerusalem, we're going to read it, is a bride who is married to Jesus Christ. So even those that are evil, that are not following God, they're going, I'm, I'm married. I'm married. I'm not a widow. They know instructively the marriage of the people that are following Him to Jesus Christ is coming, and she's trying to say it doesn't matter. Isn't that interesting? Let's move on. I know I'm hammering on this, but this is such a stronghold in America. It says that sin is pleasurable for a season. And it is. Doing all the stuff that you're not supposed to do is pleasurable. And the sensual, when it says sensual, it's not talking about just sex, although that's a big part of it. It talked about that's how he held people captive. That's how that territory. But it's anything sensual. It's being led by our bodies instead of our spirits. See, in the Garden of Eden, we were led by our spirit our soul started to try to understand, and then our body followed. When, because our life was from the Spirit God. Then when we fell, we lost that connection, so now we live by our bodies telling us what to do. Our soul tends to agree. Sometimes it gets uh, guilty, and the Spirit's basically dead. So the world is celebrating, live by your body. And... The problem is this, sin is fun for a season, but it's never connected to real life. Real life, real joy, real peace comes from being connected with your spirit. And so the devil entices us with all these physical things and riches so that we don't pay attention to our spirit. Go to Matthew, uh, oh wow, so many verses. Let's go to Matthew 5.14. This concept of cities is important. We tend, as Western Christians, think of the city of Babylon, city of New Jerusalem, as someplace off in the future. There will be a New Jerusalem somewhere off in the future. Babylon, who knows? They'd have to hurry up. There's no Babylon right now. So if you believe that, he's not coming back for 40, 50, 60 years. It takes a long time to build a city. But it's a metaphor. 
And it's all through the Scriptures. Let me just give you one, and then you can go study it on your own. Hebrews 5.14, you are a light for the world. What does it say after that? He started building the new Jerusalem when he rose again and appointed apostle, prophet, pastor, evangelist, teachers, and anointed the Holy Spirit came and started the church. The church is the city. Let me give you another one. Ephesians, I didn't even write down the passage. Is it 2-2? I got 22 down. There's not 22 chapters. Maybe Ephesians 2-2 is this. Through Him, you also are being built, 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 built. What's built? A city. In the Spirit, together with others, into a place where God lives. I know I'm really theological tonight, but I'm trying to see, let you see how important it is. And Revelation is going on right now. Turn over to, go down, let's go back to Revelation. Go to Revelation 21.2. Because we need to see the antidote to sex and riches. Because that is how he has enslaved the world. Sex and riches. It's very powerful. Sex and riches. It's very powerful. I'm not going to argue with it. Revelation 21.2. Then I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, dressed like a bride ready for her husband. Go down, back up to Revelation 19.8. We are just hitting the tops, and I feel bad for not delving into this, but y'all can study. This is more, maybe better than I do. Revelation 19.8. It's talking about this city. She has been given the privilege of wearing dazzling pure linen. This fine linen represents the things that God's holy people do that have His approval. Fine linen, holy people. So what do you think the antidote to sex is? Babylon versus New Jerusalem. Any guesses, thoughts? I mean, it says it right here. Righteousness, godliness, sanctification, purity... Do you realize how hard it is to be pure in this society? It's crazy, man. At least it is for me. Integrity. And so with all this onslaught, in two different places it talks about the city of Babylon is like raging waters. And in another place it says it's peoples and thoughts that are raging over the city. It's all around us, isn't it? The impurity, let's just say impurity versus purity. It is hard to walk in purity. I mean, I can't tell you how many pastors at a, at a mega church level, because those are the only ones that ever get reported, that are getting called in sexual sins. And for every one Mega church pastor, there's probably 25 that you've never heard of that still it's happening, or 50. And so we're going to pray at the end, Lord, we want to be led by our spirit. We want to be the city of the new Jerusalem that you're building now. We want to display purity. Because even now, the world is starting to get sick of some of this stuff. The devil's pushed his hands too far. And gone too far with it. And people are starting to get repulsed by it. But what are they going to go to? They're going to go those that have light. It is amazing. Go back and read the New Jerusalem. You know, is it a physical city or not? To some degree it is. We'll see. But when you read that, uh, almost every description of that city, there's verses in the New Testament that talks about What's ha- that it is happening to you now, like the streets of gold that are so clear. Clear gold means there's no impurities. What does the Father say? I'm going to refine you like fire. I'm going to refine you like gold in the fire. 
you're becoming the streets now. You go look at the gates and the foundations. There's verses for it all through the New Testament of working on our character. He is preparing you now. And in some ways, it's, it's not fun living in this society, but in some ways, it's going, Father, I thank you that I was birthed at this time. And you knew that with my help, with his help, I'm strong enough to stand against the bulwark of these raging dark waters that are coming into this place. I am strong enough. And your reward, one day you'll stand before the Father and go, I stood. Maybe I didn't do it always right. I wasn't always perfect. But I stood there. And I overcame. And it is a testimony to every demonic demon. I threw everything at them that their sensual five senses, sensual is whatever appeals to your five senses, not just sex. I threw everything at it and they said, no, I choose Jesus as my bride instead of a widow that has no inheritance. So what do you think the antidote to riches is? Or the opposite to riches is? Content's a big one. That's actually my closing verse. What would you say? You may have to speak louder. Yep. Turn over to 3 John 1, 2. John says here, Beloved, I pray that in all respects you may prosper and be in good health, just as your soul prospers. True prosperity is joy, peace that we had earlier. There are people with a lot of money that would have given a lot of money to get what you all had earlier. Because they can't get it any other way. They've tried it. They've tried things. They've bought things. They've had counseling sessions. They've done whatever therapy, drugs, alcohol. And they can't get peace because peace is an inside job. Peace, you can control peace of your circumstances on the outside, but it does not affect your inside. Peace is an inside job which flows from being led by the Spirit. Are you all right? Y'all still hanging with me? How long have I been talking here? Matthew 6.33, But seek first His kingdom and His righteousness, and then all these things will be given to you as well. So the antidote to the sensual side of life, which has become quite perverted in America, I mean way beyond any rationale. Why? Because the demonic forces are showing their hands. Is purity, godliness... Living from the Spirit instead of the flesh. How many... The problem is, is you live purely from the sensual side of life. By the time you're about my age, I'm 63 and older, it starts eating you up and you become just somebody nobody wants to be around. Have you ever noticed that? That person that's negative, that doesn't forgive, they sort of hide. When they get to about my age, they just become bitter, grumpy old people. They can't control it anymore. They don't have enough self-control. They've lost all self-control because they live by their five senses. One of the fruits of the Holy Spirit is self-control. And you'll be amazed. And what saddens me, I, I, I counsel not a lot, but some, especially younger people, if they've grown up without any biblical worldview, they do things, I won't even put names on it because we tend to make one sin worse than the other. They do things and just think it's all right. But then when you look at the consequences of their decisions, you realize this is not going to end well. This is not going where you think it's going to go. Why? It's sim- so God, so you tell them, why don't you try to stop this? And then they get mad at you thinking you're taking away their freedom. And that God is a prude. Well, 
I guess we are taking away your freedom in a, in a sense, but you take it away. But you gain, some, you gain more freedom in a different area. When you live purely by your senses, you become bound to those senses. And then, I mean, who's ever taken alcohol or pills or no, legitimate narcotics like oxycodone or whatever? And then one day, and they took them thinking, I can't wait till I get addicted. Because then you're bound. But if they had bound themselves, and it's the best by the Spirit of the Holy Spirit, ahead of time, you never get bound by your five senses. And the thing is, you never know when you cross that line. I see this not as much as I used to, because most people stop smoking. But smoking is one of those things you're smoking. And if you want to smoke, smoke. I'm not on your case. Okay? But one day you're going to be addicted and you don't know it till you are. And then it's just not fun. My father was addicted to smoking. Okay? He couldn't quit it his entire life. And he was one of the most self-disciplined people I've ever seen. But in that area, he was bound because he didn't bind himself to the power of the Holy Spirit and the fruit of the Holy Spirit to begin with. So you choose your bondage. But I'm telling you, when you bind yourself to the Holy Spirit, He always leads you to the tree of life. He always leads you to true freedom. And He will always lead you to prosperity. His consequences are good. It always is. And so I share this with you to let you know you're fighting and to be on guard. This sexual spirit is everywhere. It's in the pulpits. It's in the congregations. I mean, I heard that the things you hear that I've heard from ministers say of why they committed adultery, they have lost their minds. When you give yourself purely to the flesh, your mind gets real small. I mean, this is legit. I've heard this about two or three pastors. So maybe there's this rumor going along among pastors. And this typically is in charismatic circles. Well, David had a lot of women, and look how anointed he was. I've heard him say that. And I'm like, yeah, Absalom rebelled. Tamar got raped. His son died. Yeah, he really was anointed in those areas. Those are direct consequences of sleeping with the wrong women. Bathsheba was the direct consequence. So you see what I'm saying? So you can... so. Be careful of rationalizations. Tie yourself to the Holy Spirit. Let Him teach you all that He wants to teach you. And you will be a part of a city that's a light, that's set on the hill, that in this day and week, maybe this week, somebody's finally tired of sleeping with 4,800 women. And they got 4,800 STDs. And they go, there's got to be a better way to live. And they see you. They see whoever, Jason over here or, or Jeremy or whoever's being pure, going, how do you do it? Why do you do it? And you can show them the light. That doesn't mean we're perfect, but we're going in a direction because there is very little light, but it's arising and it's growing and it's getting bigger. Um, oh, man, there's so much to talk about. Gosh. Well, we got next week, right? What's that? Let me close with this verse. First Timothy six six. This is the godliness with contentment. Sums it up. Godliness, contentment. Godliness, contentment. But godliness is all that we've been talking about, purity and going after him. Let me, I'm just going to tell you, you will not take a loss. Whenever you do stuff that's against what the Lord's saying, it's somewhere down the road, it's, it's just not going to end well. It, it always has consequences. Why? Because the devil will make sure you have it. Why do you think abortion is a sacrament of the left? Yeah, I went there. Because then there's no consequences or less. There's lots of consequences. Don't get me wrong. 
I can have sex without restraint. I don't have to take care of a kid somewhere. It's also because of John 10.10. He says, I've come to give you life and life more abundantly, and but the devil has come to steal, kill, kill, and destroy. He hates you with a passion. If it wasn't for God's power, if it wasn't for him working through angels, every one of you would be dead before you fell asleep tonight. And he would be happy. Why? Because he doesn't give a damn about you. He then can turn to God and say, I destroyed your image. Here it is. I mean, it's heavy, but we're in a spiritual warfare. Look at this picture on the left when you go in the lobby. That's what Jesus is going to look like when he comes back because it's a, a painting out of Revelation. He's, he's after those who destroy his image. And when we live by our flesh, we're destroying his image because his image is to flow out of the Spirit. And I know this is a heavy revy, but I don't apologize. So he, he kills them at the lower end in abortion. And he laughs at God and says, another one in your image was killed. 50,000 people in the last two years were killed in Canada through assisted euthanasia. It's coming to America. And he's laughing. He's laughing. It's not freedom. Your purpose was prematurely killed. I know there's pain. I know it's complications. I'm not downplaying that. But there's no opportunity for a victor. There's no opportunity for the miracles of God to come through. There's no opportunities for, for healings. Well, what about, and I'm going to go there because this is just, if you don't agree, that's fine. That's all right. Well, it's my body, my choice on abortion. It's not your body. That fetus, embryo, baby has a different DNA than you. Now, if you've had an abortion, there's no condemnation here because there's lies of the enemy that he can heal us from. But it's a different DNA. Well, that baby can't live without me. That doesn't make sense. That's true. But you take a one-year-old and you leave him alone at your house for three weeks. You come back, that baby's going to be dead because they can't live without you either. Let me, let me, I can feel it in here, but it's okay. Because we've got to punch through this stuff because the life of Jesus is amazing. And in that, when that physical egg and sperm came together and did a physical DNA, there was a spiritual DNA came that came from the heaven and said, I can't wait to see what happens here. So if some of you are called an accident, you are not an accident. God said, I'll let you live because I needed you. Let me end with this. There's, there's a lot of miracles in the earth. There's a lot of cool spots. I've been in a lot of cool countries. I come over this bridge in the morning, come into church from the east. I'm sorry, from the west. And almost always there's a sun coming over Fort Mountain and grassy mountain in the west. It's gorgeous. It's a miracle. It's one of the coolest things. And those are just small things. You can see it in little wildflowers. You can see it in dogs. You know, one of the things that the Lord started helping, on just a side point, started helping me to get out of my introvert and more into extrovert. He said, treat the people you meet like your dog treats you. That dog, it don't matter what's going on, is always happy to see me. Have you ever thought about that? God is just hilarious in his instructions. But let me talk about women for a minute. This, You women, this is the most amazing thing ever, is the process of birth and babies. Just think about it. If it wasn't for you, and if the devil didn't get his way that everybody's killed... Or if you didn't have any more, let me say it this way, if you didn't have any more babies, or we kill them all, 100 years from now there would be no humans. The miracle of birth, we've got four kids, the miracle of birth, of that little seed, they say it was, it, it was guys and girls made it happen. Ah, guys didn't really have much to do with it, okay? Yes, technically. But to grow that thing in your body, grow that thing, grow that baby in your body, 
and then give birth. That is the greatest natural miracle on this planet and in the human, human condition. There is nothing comparable to it. And you guys, I know it's hard, and I know the delivery is hard because of the result of Eve and Adam and Eve's sin, but that is an amazing thing. Now you see why the devil doesn't want it to happen. It is a God thing. It is a God principle. It brings God's life into the earth. And um, I'm not a woman. I'm not a trans woman, trans man. I don't even know what it is. But it, I, it is, it would be, I could, it's an awesome privilege to be a woman. I don't want to be a woman, so we're not going to get weird here. But it is an awesome privilege to do that. How many of you women would agree that? And, and this world has desecrated it, has put it down, has saying we don't want this thing. It's, you know, just sleep and be happy. Why? Because he doesn't want to bring more little kids into the world that look like God. Let's stand. Man, y'all got a long message today. I guess, you, I guess you got your money's worth. And if you only gave 50 cents, you still got your money's worth. I do like to end if there's any comments. Now, we can't, we're not going to preach a whole other sermon. Is there any 30 second comments or questions anybody want to say before we uh, break up here? Did everybody hear? All right. It is. And it's disguised as freedom. You've got to, that's why we're doing this. You've got to, dis- okay, it's freedom, I guess, at one level, but it's bondage in the end. Yeah. 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 For those who didn't hear, pretty thanks, Craig, for having the, the courage to say abortion is law. Period. And I'm not trying to frame this like a, Thus saith the Lord, hellfire and brimstone. I'm trying to show the other side. Look at the life he's trying to bring into this earth. There are blessings. We've been told it's not a blessing. It is a blessing. Now, the hardest thing I've ever done in my life is raise kids. But it's worth it. And then when I start whining about it, Jesus goes, Now you know how it feels for me to raise you. (laughs) He did. He's told me that two or three times. He said, Stop whining. You did worse. (laughs) All right, okay. Father, I thank you for these people. I thank you that you are preparing them. And that's why we're doing it, preparing them to be soldiers against the darkness, to stand against the raging waters of filth, to to be the hope and the light of people around them. And they need it. I can't imagine, Father, after walking fully in the devil's ways and all the depression that comes and the hopelessness that comes and all the physical consequences come, having nobody to turn to and say, where is life? Where is light? And I thank you that in this room enough, there's enough people to affect a huge part of this county that you will make sure they find life and light in them. And Father, I thank you your life is growing in us We're becoming a pure, dazzling white bride, not in the future, but now. Yes, the marriage supper of the Lamb's in the future. Yes, the full revelation of of us coming down the aisle, which is like the city coming out of the heavens, is in the future. But we're getting dressed now. And we thank you for the privilege of walking with you. In Jesus' name, amen.